On this episode of China Unscripted, why the Olympics is Xi Jinping's crowning moment, Wall Street is tripling down on China, and could there be a black swan event that takes down the CCP? Welcome to China Unscripted, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Jack Posobiec. He's a former naval intelligence officer and current host of the show Human Events Daily. Jack, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Very excited to be here. What's going on, fellas? Oh, well, you know, just a pretty big year for the Chinese Communist Party. You know, at the end of the year, they got the 20th Party Congress coming up. So what's what's at stake for Chinese leader Xi Jinping? Well, see, the way I look at it is, and I've, I've actually got a piece that's coming out in a pretty, uh, pretty major compl- uh, publication that's going to ruffle some feathers when it when they see who's publishing me. But the piece is essentially written that even though the National Party Congress isn't until November, so the same year as America or same month as America's midterm elections, that really the Beijing Olympics next week, this is essentially the CCP Olympics are a coronation ceremony for Xi Jinping. Not only has he essentially uh, defeated all opposition internally from within the CCP, within the inner party factional uh, factions that we've seen, John Zemin, et cetera. But he's really defeated anyone outside of China that or defeated, neutralized, co-opted or merged um, with any meaningful resistance that he would have seen. And, and, you know, you'd think with everything that they've done from COVID-19 to trade to what they're doing with the Uyghurs, you'd think that there'd be every possible reason, right, for countries to say, yeah, you know, we're going to have to forego these Olympics, right? This is not, you know, 1936 in Berlin. We don't want to go with this anymore. But he's run the table. And so I think that rightfully, in a sense, right, from his perspective, this is his coronation ceremony as not only the national paramount leader, lifetime leader of the party, the first one they've had since Mao, but also just the PRC and the the CCP-dominated PRC as a really dominant force within world politics. So you think it's in the bag for Xi? He will be leader for life? Oh, I think it's in the bag. I mean, I, I mean, you, you, his anti-corruption purges that have been going on, obviously since you know, really he came to power in 2012. But from Zhou Yokong on, I mean, these are getting high-level national publicized. TV shows, they're the most popular shows, most watched shows in China. Whenever he purges officials, then he's making the officials go on TV, right? National broadcasts conduct their own self-incrimination struggle sessions, uh, essentially admit to their corruption, admit to what they've done. He has run the table on when it comes to CCP on this. And Jiang Zemin, I, you know, I give him credit for trying, I guess, but the technocrats, that wing of the party, and this is something that I break down in the piece as well. They had an opportunity. They potentially had an opportunity in early 2020 or even mid 2020 to come clean about what happened in that Wuhan lab, come clean about the lab leak, come clean about the research, the gain of function that was being done there. But they didn't do it. And why? Because the line that the technocrats wouldn't, you know, uh, in Tao as well. And of course, prior to that, Deng Xiaoping, the line that they won't cross is anything that would really lead to the downfall of the party itself, the downfall of the regime. And look, they've studied, CCP studied the downfall of the Soviet Union very closely. They understood the role that Chernobyl played in all of that, not only in terms of their international recognition, but also just in terms of their legitimacy within Russia itself. And so they're not about to admit to a global Chernobyl anytime soon, where I think it's over uh, 5 million people have died in this thing at this point. They're not going to admit it. So had they actually played that card, that may have been the only thing that could have stopped Xi Jinping, but they didn't do it because they knew that it would have um, would have undermined the party so much and potentially led to their downfall. So I think at this point, because they kept their powder dry on that, that Xi Jinping has it in the bag. Absolutely. Now, there is some talk um, among some China analysts that the Princeling faction, which is not really an organized faction, it's really just the sons and daughters of elite party founders, uh, that there might be some dissatisfaction amongst this group uh, with Xi Jinping, um, particularly in regards to Taiwan. Do you think, have you seen anything that uh, makes you think that could be an issue for Xi? Well, I suppose it would do 
it would be determined it on whether what their dissatisfaction was. So are they dissatisfied that Taiwan hasn't become, you know, fully merged with the mainland at this point? Or are they dissatisfied because they think that he's been, you know, uh, been too, you know, stringent and uh, too aggressive across the Taiwan Strait? Um, I think you've probably got both schools of thought within the princelings right now. But at the same time, you're, you're still not seeing anyone or any faction that's really bringing enough critical mass to bear that would be able to successfully challenge him because he's done a fantastic job of, you know, playing the Game of Thrones of it, right? The Game of Thrones of the internal politics and the internecine, you know, kind of uh, levers of power in different factions within Zhongnanhai and within the party itself that he's either co-opted them or he's neutralized any faction that would really bring any meaningful opposition to him. And this is exactly why you see those purged officials being paraded across national TV on such a regular basis, because every single person that would potentially even has the thought of opposing Xi knows where they're going to end up. It's a message, clear. And it's, it's, it's textbook, uh, textbook party propaganda. This is something they've been doing for, for 50 years. They've perfected it at this point. He's still purging, though. It feels like he's not exactly feeling secure yet because there's still purges going on. There's a new round of purges going on with the political and legislative affairs committees. And he's it just seems like Xi Jinping, he's not treating it like he's got it in the bag. Well, I would say that, um, you know, basically my assessment is that he knows, right? He knows that he can continue to do this, right? The minute you see the purges stop, that way, I think, would be more interesting. I think it would be more interesting to see if the momentum stopped, the direction stopped, because then you might see, OK, is there a limit to his power within the party? Right now, you really haven't seen that. He's able to take down whoever he puts his sights on. And so that's basically the way I'm looking at this and saying, look, he's going to pick this thing up next week. Everyone's going to the Olympics. There's no meaningful boycotts that are happening. Uh, no companies are really no the company, you know, the American companies, Wall Street Journal has talked about this, where a lot of the multinationals are saying, well, we are sponsoring, but we're not promoting. We're maybe doing some ads within China, but not outside of China. But again, you're not seeing any meaningful pullback outside of China in terms of this. So he's got the international community in the bag. And by November, he'll clearly have this in the bag. There's there. Show me, show me the faction, show me the person that can stand up to him and stop the freight train that is Xi Jinping right now. I just don't see it. Well, I don't know. We have a, a really mean t-shirt criticizing the Beijing Olympics. I think once people start wearing that. Well, I haven't I seen the t-shirt yet. So, you know, maybe you guys have some secret weapons that I'm not familiar with, but maybe when this thing drops, it might be the one thing that lays across those tracks and blows the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> what if what if there's a, a disaster in China like a or black something? Swan. Yeah, some kind of unexpected. There was. <laughs> well, That's true. true. <laughs> yeah, if they can swing the coronavirus, like what what possibly could happen? He is able to pick, look, and I think you, you know. The last time I was on, we talked about this as well. That that was the one time where, and it wasn't even just Xi Jinping; it was the entire party. Where I thought since Tiananmen. Right. This is the one moment where they actually are at the most vulnerable that they've been since they since 1949. And he was able to swing it. He was able to swing it because they already had the pieces in place at the WHO. They already had the agreements from the IOC. And he's it's not even just that that this is, a, you know, I, I saw like Peter Schweitzer has this idea about elite capture. And I think he's only got half the, the story. Right. Because this is actually a merger. Right. You're seeing a merger between Western elites and the CCP. And she, of course, has completely encouraged that and allowed that to take place because he knows that the more they are reliant and dependent on China, the more power, the more influence, the more leverage he has. And he was able to use that leverage and before everyone's eyes, a completely, you know, plain view of the public, because if you go back to those, just go back to the original reports. Remember, Wuhan coronavirus. Wuhan coronavirus. Then suddenly it, it morphs into coronavirus, and then that morphs into COVID nineteen. And now the story of Wuhan, the lab. This is this has been completely relegated to podcasts. You know, maybe an article here or there when people can admit, yeah, it probably did come from the lab. But at the same time, no meaningful repercussions. And then what do you have though? You've got Xi Jinping 
at Davos being introduced as your excellency by Klaus Schwab and, and giving the keynote speech at da well, the virtual Davos, which was held last week. I mean, to me, it looks like a situation where if he not only has he uh, completely accomplished, right, swinging that entirely in his favor, but if you can't take COVID-19, I mean, what are you, what else could you do, right? He's he swung locked out, locking down entire cities, which obviously you're still seeing that their city, I think Xi'an just lost, just reopened, reopened up. Uh, Ningbo is going in and out. Shanghai is going in and out. They've got this huge, what do they call it? The exclusion zone, the, the bubble. Oh, for the Olympics. The closed loop, yes. The closed loop, right. Yeah, but even they're still, you know, uh, seeing some infections break out because as we've seen with Omicron and some of these other variants, it's breaking through a lot of this stuff. The, if he's able to swing all of that in his favor, I just don't know what other disaster that he wouldn't be able to do the same thing with. Well, so what's going to be the, the the next thing for Xi Jinping? What's going to be the goal if like he's really got it in the bag, like you say he does? Well, I think the next I think it's going to be interesting. Right. So I, I think it the reason that you're still seeing the purges right now is because he wants to solidify this. So I've seen a lot of people saying that, you know, Taiwan is next. Uh, Putin's going to take Ukraine and she's going to take Taiwan. And I don't know if I'm quite there yet. I just don't see the tea leaves trending in that direction. I still think that when it comes down to it, his greatest um, or most successful strategy with Taiwan is this generational strategy that they've been on. Uh, were he to go after Taiwan through military action, that would be because he saw a threat to his legitimacy, a threat to his rule, a threat to the party's legitimacy. But because you don't have that threat, you don't have that external force that's forcing his hand, why not just simply go along with where he's, uh, you know, he's already pitched himself. Now, at the same time, you are seeing the expansion really of China on the maritime stage outside of Asia Pacific in ways that we haven't seen before. Really, I, I think in, in terms of all of, of Chinese history, um, you're seeing their agreements in Africa on the Atlantic. You're seeing their agreements in the Caribbean. Um, I come to this as a, as a prior Navy intelligence officer. So, of course, I'm always going to um, I'm always going to be a little more biased towards seeing what's going on on the seas. But because shipping is, of course, one of the major concerns for China, this has also been one of the biggest issues in the supply chain crisis, because as the lockdowns have hit in places like Ningbo, places like Tianjin, um, that's led to a lot of these supply chain issues that we're seeing in the U.S. and, and across the West. I think you're going to see an increase in Chinese uh, shipping and port um, agreements in the Atlantic Ocean. I also think you're going to see a lot more Chinese naval activity in those areas to be able to secure their maritime commercial interests. And I think over land, you are going to see more and more. You know, I mentioned Ukraine a second ago. You're going to you're seeing now continental Europe is starting to kind of move away from the U.S. U.K. axis and NATO. And I think they are moving a lot closer to China in terms of this. The EU is looking at China as a potential economic and commercial vector for them in a way that they haven't seen before. That's why the head of the German Navy was just fired last week, this vice admiral, because when he was down in India saying um, that we should, you know, we should unite with India and Russia and form this anti-China bloc. I mean, they immediately fired him for saying that. Well, so for China to create this sort of maritime empire that you're suggesting, it needs to lock down the South China Sea, which they've been very successful at, but they still need Taiwan to get that final linchpin of the South China Sea. Uh, now, you seem to be saying they, that they are still going to push this sort of uh, generational one country, two systems model um, that they tried with Hong Kong, but it seems like the Taiwanese public is, is very against that. And with the frequent incursions of the Chinese you know, Air Force into Taiwan's e uh, EEZ, do you think they really expect the generational thing to work or, you know, why would they be do planning that when it seems like the Taiwanese population does not want it? And at the same time, China is pushing this very heavy handed military aggression. You know, the one interesting thing that I've noticed with with Taiwan lately, and a lot of this is being pushed by the DPP there, is that they seem to be going kind of woke. Have you guys noticed that at all? What is woke? <laughs> what is woke? Um, so it's sort of this this. Um, like uh, political correctness on like political correctness from the 90s, but on steroids. Right. Just a lot, you know, pushing a lot of green policies, pushing a lot of like this uh, pie in the sky, you know, as my grandma would probably call it, like hippy dippy, um, you know, good time, funky hour type policies. 
um, it, it seems like the DPP is actually, in some cases, softening a lot of Taiwan's institutions. And I really question why that would be, because if they obviously were put in a wartime scenario with um, with China, uh, you're going to need some hardened institutions and you're certainly going to need a hardened society to be able to do that. Um, you're just I'm just not seeing that same type of rhetoric from the DPP in terms of that. When I look I really at the domestic policies in terms of what they're doing, um, uh, huge green energy pushes, huge pushes for uh, against climate change and a lot of things that, you know, maybe down the road would would be you know very successful for them. But but in the, the near term, um, really, you'd think that shoring up their their energy base as well as their ability to. And I have seen, by the way, some excellent economic deal. Um, deals that are being made, if, particularly within the semiconductor front between Taiwan and the United States in places like Ohio, places like Arizona, where they're looking at building prefab sites there. I mean, I really think this is Taiwan's comparative advantage. They've got to keep stressing that pushing forward uh, as far as whether. So obviously, you know, I get the question you're asking is, will will they invade Taiwan? I don't see it quite yet. I don't think they need to do it quite yet. Um, I think that they're going to continue to try their their softer policy just because it's working for them. Right. It's working very well for them. They've been extremely successful at this. Everybody's making money. The military is getting much larger. And at the same time, uh, the same situation, by the way, that Putin and Ukraine are looking at right now, they know that if they go to direct conflict, right, that they're going to lose their ability to get those economic deals or their or the ability for in Russia's case to get those security guarantees from Ukraine. Right, uh, vis a vis their NATO membership. At the same token, if China goes and crosses the line and just invades Taiwan, that obviously is going to kill their international standing. And even, and, and the Western elites aren't going to be able to just say, oh, well, that's fine, right? Because we haven't gone through the one country, two systems process. There's no, been no quote unquote handover of Taiwan. It wouldn't even make sense the same way there was for Hong Kong. So, um, even when they conducted the jackbooted crackdowns on, hang, on Hong Kong throughout 2019 and 2020, it kind of was already a fait accompli because the West had, by and large, given up Hong Kong back in the 90s and the negotiations back in the 80s. And so I think with Taiwan, especially, by the way, if you look at American opinion polling, um, what strikes me as quite interesting is that there's no appetite. Really, there's like a 30 percent approval rating or, you know, a support rating for going to war in Ukraine. There's just there's just no support for it whatsoever. But when you ask the same question about Taiwan in the defense of Taiwan, should the United States come? It's something like 60, 70 percent. So it sounds like Taiwan, an invasion of Taiwan could be an actual kind of black swan event that could mess things up for Xi Jinping. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously, that I guess that comes to, you know, would it be a huge miscalculation on his part? And I, you haven't seen many miscalculations from Xi Jinping, right? He has done a very good job of playing the chessboard. He's done a very good job of understanding where foreign leaders are going to come down when they respond to different things. He understands uh, he understands our system better than we do. He's got excellent advisors in terms of understanding the West. And you're, you're also seeing, by the way, that they are, you know, certainly working to harden their uh, their culture, you know, cracking down on on uh, various forms of internet, various forms of what they call uh, uh, disruptive behaviors on the internet. And so I could see a situation though, where potentially, and just, you know, again, hypothetically to answer your question, that he becomes so overconfident that he thinks that an invasion is in the cards, um, but it would, it, would, it would take a little bit while for him to get there. I think uh, what's interesting is that they seem to be, well, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party seem to be trying to insulate their economy from the world economy in terms of as you were saying like you know if they if they did invade taiwan there would be a bunch of pushback from the west like we wouldn't be able to just say it's no big deal but like with this whole dual circulation thing they're doing right where they're trying to be like okay we're going to be self-reliant on our uh, domestically, but we still mm -hmm. want the world to be reliant on us for manufacturing. But we need to be good at semiconductors. We need to be in a place where we don't have to rely on, you know, Western financial institutions or Western, uh, you know, semiconductors, this kind of stuff. Like, do, does this seem like it's getting ready for a point when they wouldn't need to worry if the West, uh, you know, turned their back after a Taiwan invasion? Uh, well, they certainly want to get to that point, and they want to get to the point where they are self-sufficient from not only the SWIFT system, but um, essentially the way that they've 
very carefully and very cautiously been looking at ways to take down the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency. And, you know, whenever whenever they talk about currency, they sort of talk about, well, you know, moving to a basket of currencies or allowing different currencies to be allowed to be used on the One Belt, One Road system um, there, you know, or, or looking at ways to potentially use One Belt, One Road to circumvent the petrodollar and then be able to, of course, they you know, they want to get, you know, bottom line is they want to get their oil from Iran. They also want to do deals in Saudi Arabia. They're also doing deals in Iraq right now. Huge, by the way, uh, push for um, for Chinese companies in Iraq that's going on this week. And they want that overland through essentially, you know, you probably can't get pipelines through uh, Pakistan and Xinjiang, but maybe maybe railroads and then pipelines to some extent, uh, just because of how mountainous it is and how uh, how cold it is in certain points of the year. But, uh, you know, if we can get a pipeline across Alaska, who's to say they can't do it either? And so that's one of the main things that they're looking at in terms of oil, because they've got to fuel all this, right? Their energy costs are astounding, and they know that this is a huge problem for them. This is also why shipping is so important to them, because they have to import pretty much all of their oil right now by sea. They don't have the ability to do it overland. And so that's a huge, huge issue for U.S. policymakers, because as you're looking at this question of, you know, should Russia be uh, aligned with the United States against China? Well, the more you demonize Russia, you're the more you drive them into the arms of China, the same way that the EU is now looking at having good uh, commercial and economic relations with China and potentially seeing them as a replacement for the United States as you know the dominant power in the world. And so if that is the case, then, like you say, they are going to be building a system more and more that has nothing to do with direct links or reliance on the United States system or anything that's based out of you know New York or Washington. So if the Chinese Communist Party succeeds in its ambitions, what would that mean for the United States? I mean, you're you're essentially you're right, you know, you become then a consumer culture, right? You become a culture where your economy is already hollowed out, your country's hollowed out, you you know, you you're not able to find meaningful work in uh, you know, outside of, you know, these sort of digital jobs job space. And so the, the backbone of the country is just kind of broken. But, you know, you can make money online, you can get your continue to, you know, purchase your, your cheap imported CCP goods. Um, and then, you know, click over to the next, you know, what's 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 coming up next on Netflix, rather than having these holistic, vibrant communities that we've seen in the past, and a, a way to, you know, and you're seeing this more and more with escapism and escapist technology, like metaverse, like Oculus, you know, the way these things are kicking off, it's, you know, it's, uh, I, would, I don't even want to say it's going to be exactly like, you know, the, the opening scene of Ready Player One, where the guy's living in a trailer park, but, you know, he puts on his goggles, and then he's immersed in this, in this wide eyed, uh, futuristic, I think he's like in space as well, he gives spaceships and stuff. But, you, you know, you're really seeing that some of that sci-fi stuff come home to roost because the vibrant type of society seems to be leaving the United States behind. And people think I think people get a general sense that American society is I don't know if it's completely declined, but it, you know, it's it's become stagnant. Right. It's become quite stagnant. Hollywood can't find an original thought anywhere. Um, our our businesses, you know, seem to be sort of just kind of recirculating the same type of stuff and it's become much more insular whereas in china you see vibrancy you see they're constantly rebuilding things uh they're building new bridges they're building new subways the subways the airports their infrastructure is going through the roof people are making a lot of money people are getting rich this is obviously something that the party is trying to to uh you know cramp down upon it's almost like shanghai right now is like new york in the 1980s right everybody's just trying to get get rich it's all about money and the party of course is trying to cr to clamp down on that a little bit clamp down on those those desires you know <laughs> talk about communism right by the way it's it's it's, it's state capitalism you know i remember this when i when i lived in shanghai and I, I did my stint at the american chamber of commerce and i also worked for an international firm there you know, we would see delegations, um, congressional delegations, senators, governors, uh, you know, or just just business groups that would come in. And they were totally enamored, totally enamored with the CCP system. They said, well, you know, you can just smash down houses and kick people out of the way so you can build your maglev. You can, you know, get rid of whole neighborhoods if you want to build a Shanghai Disneyland, you know, uh, you human rights, what are those completely checked out. So the ability, the power, right, the power behind it was so intoxicating to them that really it, it became an infatuation. And so you're seeing 
or we were told originally, I guess, in the 80s that uh, the opening up of China would lead to the liberalization of China, the democratization of China, but it's actually been the opposite that's taken place, right? So with the West opening up to China, it's made the West more authoritarian. It's made the we Western elites more willing to use these types of tools. And we've already got an ESG system on Wall Street, which is essentially a corporate social credit score. So it's really changed the tenor of how things work because essentially they're just, they've seen the progress of the CCP system and they say, you know what, I like that, I want for my, that for myself. Well, I think something interesting you mentioned is just the general kind of cultural malaise that has uh, you know, beset the United States as uh, a real factor in why the Chinese Communist Party could rise. Uh, we talk a lot on the show about like, you know, what, you know, the U.S. government could do to counter the Chinese Communist Party. But with this kind of cultural aspect of it, what can individual Americans do to kind of turn back the tide? Well, so I think that, you know, there, I've seen some of those like, you know, by made in American movements. And of course, you know, I always support that. I always say that, you know, we, we always buy American cars. That's just something my family's always done. But at the same time, it, it really needs to be a political response at this point, because there are so many people that are making so much money off of this economic relationship and off of the ability of allowing the CCP to rise. They, we've completely underwrite written it uh, in the West and certainly in the United States. So you've got to go and find political leaders out there that have the same type of beliefs and say, enough is enough. We don't want to live in this hollowed out country anymore without a manufacturing backbone, without industry. We want that back. We realize that, you know, we have to go back to a situation where because these, these multinationals, sure, they're, you know, they're headquartered in America, but they don't look at America as their country. They look at America as, you know, another market, right? Just another market to sell into. So, you know, Hollywood is a great indicator of this, right? Um, where, you know, a movie comes out, but they say, well, we have to make it play in, in, in every, every demographic and every market. So we've got to have something here for the Americans, something here for Asia, et cetera. Though it is interesting that last year CCP blocked, I think, four all four Marvel movies uh, going into China. So that that just makes me laugh. Um, and that's that's how you're looked at. So you've got to put some type of regulations in place where you turn the dial back away from this globalization, globalized economy, and bring it back to a place where, no, each each country is, is a home. It's a home of the people who live there. Uh, you have been given a right, a great right, by that country to operate there, to have your your tax base taken care of, to have to be able to run your businesses, but at the same time, you know you can't be doing so to the, to the detriment of the people that are also living in that country. So whether that you know takes the form of tariffs or other types of economic leverage, I'm all for it. I'm I'm totally uh, uh, not a free trader in terms of this. Well, it sounds to me like it's it's not just uh, you know American people should reach out to. The current politicians and trying to demand change, but maybe that you know instead of jumping on board the metaverse, people get involved in politics themselves. People get involved in business, and you know they educate themselves and actually try to get into the institutions and make change. I mean, exactly right. You know, we saw the you know the long march in China. We've seen the long or Marcuse's uh, long march through the institutions here in the United States. It's perfectly fine for the American people to do that, right? Uh, this experiment in a globalized economy has, brought, I mean, and, you know, clearly has brought many innovations, um, the ability for, you know, we're doing this podcast right now over the internet, right? You know, we, the technology revolution has been incredible. The technology revolution, I think we're not even done it, by the way. Um, it will be as big a turning point in human history as going from medieval times to modern times was. That's how big the technological revolution will be when it's done. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't see the same, number one, the same types of problems where that occurred in going through that switch. So which, of course, Industrial Revolution happens. And then immediately after that, what do we see is massive warfare across the continent of Europe. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, World War One, World War Two, mechanized warfare. We haven't even seen digitized warfare. And, and you know, you talk about the metaverse. Um, you know, what happens when, you know, Elon Musk's Neuralink is used by the CCP for uh, digital cyber operations or to go after our ships at sea? You know, we just lost an F-35 in the South China Sea. We're trying to recover that before China can. Well, what happens when they're able to use these types of technology to go after our sailors, to go after our ships, to go after our troops? Not a good 
situation. And we haven't even talked about uh, space yet, but certainly space, you know, and, you know, the there is going to be a new space race, right? The new space race is going to be as important as <laughs> think of C being a sea power, right? So being a sea power is what led first Denmark to become such uh, an international force, Spain, and then of course, uh, Great Britain, the UK being the largest empire in the world. Uh, you are going to see that exact same dynamic take place in space. So whoever is able to become a space power first and fastest is going to essentially win the next century. And right now, I don't think it looks like it's the United States. Well, I've, as I've always said, space is the final frontier. I came up with that. I was see, I was trying not to say that. I was like, <laughs> I was like trying to get through all my my thing with "Don't say space is final," but "Don't say it, don't say." It. And there you go. Love is the final frontier. Mm. So you want love warfare? Hasn't it always been war? Love warfare, yes. Love bombing. Love bombing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jack, it's interesting. Like a lot of the things you're talking about are based in kind of like the economic success of China over the last thirty years, right? But like we're also seeing things like Evergrande happen, and there's definitely a lot of tricky balancing things that the party is going through with trying to, you know, clamp down on the rich people, clamp down on capital flight, um, debt. deal with all of the debt. Like if there is some kind of economic. Um, event in China that spirals out of control. I think a lot of people think that it couldn't happen because the party has just so much control over the economy, they can just take care of everything. Right? And so far, they basically have. Yeah. But like, could there be an economic event that would then basically like wake people up in the West, like wake up these multinational companies, wake up these financial institutions that are like, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't keep pumping money into this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it really would, essentially, it would take something like that. So that is the prevailing view of Wall Street, right? The prevailing view on Wall Street is that, yes, we understand China has debt issues. Yes, we understand Evergrande happened. We understand that this could potentially, you know, you know, but why wasn't Evergrande seen as a layman moment? Well, because the party stepped in. And if the party continues to step in, then they will absorb. They are going to absorb. I mean, what BlackRock just announced, they're tripling they're tripling down their investments inside mainland China. Right around the same time, late last year, when Evergrande was coming into the news. And so I think BlackRock and Larry Fink coming out and saying that, that they were going to triple their um, their mainland China portfolio, as well as being given access as one of the only hedge funds that's able to operate in China, at least Western hedge funds that's able to operate there. Huge news on the economic front. That being said, you know, I talk to to traders a lot. Um, I, I don't, you know, want to hold myself out as a uh, as as an economic expert, but I've got people telling me that the lot the bubbles that we see today in housing, the bubbles that we see in crypto, the bubbles that we see across, you know, a lot of these major tech sectors, uh, Tesla, Amazon, SpaceX, etc., that they really feel because they've seen such. Um, I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna screw this up parabolic rises and multiple para, uh, parabolic rises one after another after another. so these huge steep spikes that you could be potentially ripe for a situation where even here in the west where we're going to see some type of correction especially um because it looks like the fed is probably going to hike rates now this was by the way the huge um the huge distinction right between xi jinping and uh, and the Fed from that Davos speech because Xi Jinping he doesn't usually comment directly on issue on you know matters of policy when he's giving a speech but he was sent a pretty strong message in his Davos speech essentially to the United States saying do not raise your interest rates this is not the time to do it um, we don't want to see that happening but it it seems like here in the United States that's going to happen because the government has to do something. And, but you know, I'm not going to play any of those games about how the Fed is not the government, et cetera. I, I know, obviously, uh, it is private, that they have to do something about inflation because it's going out of control and the administration is in the tank, uh, approval rating wise, because of inflation. So those rates are going to go up. But what kind of cascading effect does that eventually have, not only on US stocks, but as you say, on, on, um, on the CCP as well. And so, that will be interesting to see. And that's a story that I'm absolutely tracking. I find fascinating. But at the same time, you know, I just remember I've heard this so many times now 
right? You, you've heard it for 20 years that this is going to happen and it just, it just hasn't panned out yet. Well, I think what's interesting about that view on Wall Street and a lot of places now is that it seems like people have abandoned the idea that, you know, the free market is the best economic system. Like they look at China and think, oh, total state control, that is the best thing. That's going to be able to handle any challenge, which seems crazy to me because we have a history of communist regimes and greater and greater state control over the economy, and it doesn't ever work out well. Well, no, I'm in favor of state control as long as- My family's Polish. We can tell you all about that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. right. So right there. So- why, why Why? have people kind of- Because China's not communist, Chris. Well, it's, okay, mm-hmm. okay. But still, like, that kind of level of state control, why are so many financial institutions and, like, even our own government, like, abandoning the principles of the free market, free trade? Because they're getting for... rich. Because they're getting filthy rich off of this. Look, I mean, we talk about inflation right now, but inflation is something that's only a problem if you're not sitting next to the money printer, if you're sitting next to the money printer, uh, inflation is great. Inflation is wonderful because that means everyone you're getting all the free money. So why do you think that um, you started to see these massive firms buying up so much private property in the United States, buying up so much farmland in the United States? Because they know what's coming, but they've got the ability to go into the market first and just be the ones who are distorting it for all the people that are down the line from them. This is actually, this is something that's called the Cantillion effect. So the people who are closest to the money printer are the ones who benefit the most from it at the uh, at the detriment of the people on the other end of it. Cantillions, that was the enemy in Star Trek, right? I think that was the Cardassians. Oh, nerd check, I failed. At least in Deep Space Nine, Space Nine the only good Star Trek series. Ooh. Oh, all now. right. This, this just, just became way, way too, too controversial. controversial. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Well, but I, but it makes sense. I mean, that the 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 people. No, I know who, it does. Deep Space Nine is definitely better than new, the next generation. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I will die on that hill. You are taking me out of context, Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that 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 people who say they're for the free market are not really for the free market. They're just for making money. And insofar as for two hundred years, people saw the free market as the best way to ensure that they could make money. Now they see state control uh, as the best way to make money. So it's it's still principled, but it's not principled for the free market. It's just principled in the in favor of making money. You're right. They're not hypocrites. Well, this is what I like. The, there's a libertarian group called the um, the Mises Caucus, and uh, and I, I don't consider myself a libertarian at all. But they make a really good a really strong point about this to say that when you have institutions like the Federal Reserve, when you have these central banks um, that are essentially able to subsidize right their friends and give free money to the people who play along with uh, with what they want. And you have things like quantitative easing and you know, they have all these different fancy names for it, but it essentially comes down to money printing. But that isn't a free market. That is just not a free market. That is a rigged system. Um, that's not the you know, free market competition and free enterprise that, uh, you know, that people have called for. And yet they'll say it is because on one hand, they'll be perfectly willing to be the beneficiaries of inflation because their stock prices are soaring through the roof. But then they'll turn around and whenever the, anyone in government talks about putting any regulation on this, talks about dialing any of it back, that's when they suddenly turn into free marketers and say, no, 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 we can't do anything about this. We believe in the free market. That's kind of a good example of why like the whole left-right political divide is kind of illusory. It's really just oligarchs using these two different kind of arguments to force whatever they want. It's up down. It's not left right, it's up down. Yeah. 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 Well the the good thing about, you know, the Federal Reserve being a, a quasi independent institution is uh, you know, they're not really subject to the same laws and regulations. So uh they're great friends to have. Which is why it's set up that way, precisely. Oh. That's right. So what you know, getting back to, to Xi Jinping's comments though, um, I do think it's quite interesting to see then if because I, he understands the system, right? He understands that he's he is also a beneficiary of this because right, you put all of it together. BlackRock is, says triple down your investments. Um, so these guys are getting, you know, getting this money at completely, you know, it's it's essentially ne- you know a negative interest rate because uh, because of inflation. So uh, it's it's almost like getting free money when you're getting it at the top like that. And where are they? So where are they dumping it? They're dumping it in China. So because they're getting that level of foreign direct investment from the United States, then China is allowed to just grow and grow and grow and their debt becomes less of a problem for them because they're able to leverage themselves out of it. But if that 
the money spigot gets turned off in the United States, then the question becomes, what does that do for the growth of China? And that, I think, is why you saw that that he specifically addressed it at Davos in his speech. So the only way to stop the Chinese Communist Party is to destroy our own economy. Uh, uh, or just, you know, get inflation under control. Look, and I think I think you just got to bite the bullet at some point. I think you really just have to bite the bullet. I mean, look, uh, I think NFTs are cool and all. And I, I, you know, I think crypto is a great thing long term. But at the same time, because there's so much funny money floating around in the system um, on in addition to all the stimulus checks that are that have gone out there, that has also you know created more funny money in the system that it's, it's creating these massive bubbles. And because it's creating these massive bubbles, then you're eventually going to have pressure on uh, you know, bubbles pop. That's basically as simple as that. Bubbles end up popping. You're going to have pressure on the ceiling of that. And so were that to happen, right, if you have this unconstrained growth, then you're going to get situations where like, um, you know, uh, look, my, my wife was born in the Soviet Union and she'll tell stories. You know, she's actually, her parents were just telling us a story the other night about how their their bank accounts were wiped out in the course of a month because of inflation, right? You know, they had they had money in the bank and they thought they were good, um, they even had money that they thought they were going to give her, you know, later on when, um, you know, when she graduated from college and immediately, you know, the value of that was like, say it was like $10,000. Well, $10,000 became the value of like $10 in the course of one month. That's crazy. But I can also see why then Xi Jinping would want the U.S. to maintain a high rate of inflation, right? Because China has, you know, a trillion dollars worth of of U.S. bonds, essentially, that it has to pay back. And it's much easier to, to pay those back if they're not worth as much. Right, precisely. And they have they do have the hard currency holdings to be able to um, as a hedge against that inflation. At the same time, um, they still are on the petrodollar system as well as others. But you're you're absolutely correct that, you know, this is a situation where, you know, they realize that it's it is going to have to cool, cool down, slow down or potentially have blowback effect on them as well. So uh, basically, my point, my contention, though, is at least from from what the, the Wall Street guys are telling me is that, and these are you know sort of the bears, the contrarians on Wall Street, you know zero hedge readers and the like, that they think this kind of stuff. I mean, obviously nobody wants it to happen, but it's going to happen because that's the way things have been run. What exactly is going to happen? That uh, a bubble burst, so a hike increase, which leads to a burst, you know, burst bubbles in in real estate, uh, the housing markets, crypto, big tech. And then a rolling effect, which leads us into essentially another recession. But the NFTs will rebound, right? Oh, I'm holding on to my NFTs. Oh, yes. Good, good, good. <laughs> I would like to kind of uh, circle back to some of the political infighting in China uh, real quick, because I'm wondering, like, do you have any sense that, do you think there'll be like some kind of climactic conclusion to that? Like uh, Xi Jinping will bring out Jiang Zemin in chains, or will there be like any kind of like, you know, moment when we see like, oh, it's wow, over. It's over. <laughs> I, I think the most obvious one for that is is Jiang Zemin's age. I mean, he's uh, what eighty three now. Oh, he's no, 90. he's like in his nineties. He's ninety five, I think. Yeah. He's really yeah. Look, it's not long for the world. You know, it's just it is what it is, and um, I think that it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens then once Jiang Zemin passes. Because um, clearly Hu Jintao doesn't seem to wield the same type of leverage or influence over the technocrat wing of the party that Jiang has been able to, uh, who was not never really known as being someone who was uh, confrontational. Um, he was always seen as sort of just a, as a kind of a minder of the party, rather, you know, and, and one other member of the Politburo Standing Committee, um, whereas where she has really diminished the power of the Standing Committee. Um, and you know, you can see some people trying to bring that back, but I think that once Jiang goes, he'll get the state funeral. I think that he'll be, you know, he'll get the funeral with full honors. And at the, after that point, it's Xi's party. Yeah. I do think Hu Jintao is just like out of it. He's like, he's letting his hair grow white. He's just glad to Which be huge, alive. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, seeing yeah. Hu Jintao with white hair, um, when they rolled him out, uh, for the anniversary celebration, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. Yeah, I think only like Zhu Rongji did that, let himself go white. Yeah, it wasn't even that white. Like usually, because you know, it's such a it's such a 
like oh the the black hair dye thing that you know when Jo Young Kong was put under like he was arrested and then he showed up in court with white hair that was like a symbol that he didn't have power anymore right because hey, he didn't have the hair dye it's so true and it's it's funny that like I feel like people don't talk about that as much but for some reason it's just become this this thing in in the mainland in Taiwan not so much but in the mainland that uh, you know black hair dye it's everywhere and definitely within the party it's almost like allowing it to go white is a signal either that you've you've lost power or that you're you're no longer contending power right you're no longer wielding your power i was just thinking like what what if this is what takes down the chinese communist party like how ancient rome there was the problem of like you know lead cups <laughs> if like there's something in that hair dye that's just going to screw them up <laughs> uh, the whole Polybro taken out by like a lead laced black hair dye. That'd be a great history book, history of the future. That would be the real, uh, the real CIA operation if we actually had like a functional um, intelligence service that you know sending up there and sw switching the hair dye in Zhongnanhai while you know while or you, you know you don't have to go in with sheets. You have to find like the uh, you know whichever one of his servants is the one that brings it to him, right? You know, it's probably probably some girl and you, you go to her and you pay her. Obviously, you have to, you know, maybe you even hire. Right. Maybe you hire the person that goes and brings that in. This is this. this is I mean, this really sounds like a great plot of uh, Deep Royal Space Palace Nine. This, this sounds like like all yeah, those failed CIA operations to take down Castro in Cuba. Mm. Like, wasn't there some plot about like the CIA had this idea that if they could shave his beard, then he'd lose his power. That's actually right. That's that's right. There was there was a they wanted to shave his beard. Um, there was an exploding cigar plot that they tried at once. Yeah. Uh, at one point, of course, Bay of Pigs is probably the biggest um, uh, the biggest one. Also, a complete failure. Um, though that being said, you know I'm not I'm not as uh, against you you know the United States taking military action like that in in the Americas, right? You know I think the Middle you know. America plays, you know, this this role of sort of, you know, oh, let's do regime change in the Middle East. And it, it always gets screwed up and it always leads to all these issues. But, you know, that's so far away. Whereas here in our own backyard, you know, you've got Mexico controlled by cartels, you've got Cuba controlled by uh, communists or a, a middling communist regime at this point, you know, you know, that these are areas that the United States should wield influence over. Yeah. Take over Canada. Get rid of Trudeau. <laughs> Canada as well. Yes. You know, talk about, I mean, you look at the, the oil fields of Alberta, right? You know, I'm, I'm much more interested in those than I am in Iraq or Afghanistan. That's a good point. If we're going to have a war for oil. Let's, let's fight Canada. Yeah. Actually, from it's, what I- South Park had it right. <laughs> well, from what I hear about the people in Alberta, they might. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but of course, right, but, China doesn't want us talking. She doesn't want us talking like this, right? Because we're not supposed to- actually develop our own areas or like Alaska, you know, massive amounts of, of resources up there, by the way, also rare earth el elements that are in rare earth minerals that are in Alaska. This is also why you heard in the previous administration, Trump was talking about buying Greenland, right? Well, and everybody poo pooed it. Everyone said it was stupid. Well, who went in and started buying up all the mines in Greenland? It was China, of course. Well, it makes me think about how recently, um, you know, Xi Jinping was talking about like how, you know, limiting emissions is, is is good, it's important, but as long as it doesn't interfere with the normal life, we still have to uh, ensure energy security. I mean, that's just smart. Yeah, it is. But like, you know, how like, you know, John Kerry talks about how we have to work with China on climate change. It's clear that it's like they're using climate change as a weapon against the United States. I never saw actual pollution until I went to China. You know, I've been all over the United States, but then I went to Beijing. The first night I was ever in Beijing, actual acid rain. Like I remember growing up in the nineties and when thinking that acid rain was just like a common occurrence that you had to be like on the lookout for same as quicksand. Like I always thought that, you know, <laughs> quicksand would play much a, lar a much larger role in my life than it, than yeah, I don't think I've ever actually seen quicksand. But, um, the very first time that I ever saw actual acid rain was the first night I was in Beijing. I remember I was wearing a white shirt. And of course I wanted to go to Tiananmen square. Cause of course, and you know, it started raining and just destroyed everything I was wearing. I mean, there is pollution in America. I mean, have you been to Los Angeles? Yeah, but that's that was nothing like I saw in 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 Beijing. I mean, you can see that sort of has that like haze when you're in if you're in the Hollywood Hills and you're looking out across Los Angeles. But it was nothing compared to what I saw in Beijing. And certainly, the, and living in Shanghai, 
I remember like the 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 best day in Shanghai, the best weather you would get in Shanghai, the sky would be kind of like, um, you know, sort of like a post-apocalyptic orange almost, or or some kind of shade of, shade of gray. You know, they, Los Angeles, you can go to the beach, you can have, you know, bright skies, the, the water's blue, not brown. Um, it, it, it was night and day, total night and day. Yeah, my, my, one of my Biggest memories about Beijing is just you stepping off the plane and you immediately can't breathe. Exactly. Yeah. I had a friend um, who was a, a, a foreign exchange student um, and he came from China. He was living in Shanghai. He had had psoriasis his entire life, right? He was taking, taking all kinds of medicine for it, um, comes to, to NYU and within, I think, like two months, it just completely cleared up. That's amazing that the human body can heal itself so quickly if you just remove the toxins. <laughs> it's, yeah, when there's no toxic air surrounding you. So, so yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, and, and it's interesting because the party has done actually a pretty good job, right? And this is what they do, right? They actually, if you look at what their response to COVID-19, it was very similar to the response to the poor air quality. Because they, the first thing they do is they externalize it. So they don't say that we are creating it. They just say that, okay, it exists. We admit that it exists. We discuss that it exists. We declare it a threat to the party, a threat, well, not to the party, but to the nation. And then we say we need a whole of, you know, whole of society approach to defeat the war. You know, so they declared war on smog. That, then they declared war on COVID. And that has actually turned out to be a very successful strategy for them for staying in power. Because instead of actually denying something that's going on, they admit that it's happening. But they, they you know, kind of use sleight of hand to say that they're not the ones responsible for it. And then they they attack it so hard, they stay so much on offense that they're actually able to get people over that initial hump of saying, "Well, okay, but this is happening because of you." Oh, doesn't matter. We're going to defeat this. We're going to we are going to defeat the pollution. We're going to defeat the COVID. Doesn't don't worry about those gain of function experiments. Don't you worry about that Wuhan lab. Sure, Jung Lee, she's in the fight. She's helping us. She's going to defeat this thing. It's 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 actually kind of amazing to me to see how how successful they've been at it. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's been a shock for all of us too. But um, well, it's like you were talking about earlier. The, how for twenty years people have been expecting the economic collapse. They somehow just keep spinning it. Well, somehow I mean, we could stop pumping money into there. Let's not like, get crazy, <laughs> Shelley. There's there's still money to be made if we just triple our investments. Uh, yeah. But if we just triple down, then then it'll work, right? You know, it's like uh, it's like when you're in a bad relationship and you say, well, you know, we've but we've been together for so long. If we just if we just stay together a little bit longer, I can change them. I can change them, right? As every bad relationship, that's the that's the the best refrain of every bad relationship. I can change them, right? They're broken, and I can help, right? This is anyone, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. That's always the refrain: is that someone gets into this. It's it's codependency, right? And you kind you can almost look at the United States, the West relationship with the CCP as a codependent relationship. We see we keep thinking that we can change them. We keep thinking that we're that they're going to change that as long as we keep doing what they're doing that someday they're going to change. As if as if overnight, you know, some difference is going to occur as long as we keep doing. I say no, I say pull back. I say hold off. You know, this is the point where you got to go into your phone and just delete just straight up delete the contact info. Go in, and then go to your photos, delete every photo that you've had together. And say, you know what? We're done. We're breaking up. We're out. So like America a, needs to break up with China before we fall down the stairs. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying America's got to break up. We're done. We're done. They're not going to change. Any final thoughts before we wrap up, Jack? Yeah, I think that I do, at least in terms of public opinion, um, that's probably the biggest beacon of light that I've seen in terms of any of this is that. Yeah, obviously, there's a massive economic corridor that is connecting the United States, at least the elites of the United States. You know, it, it, when you know, the Occupy movement used to talk about the one percent, and so if you calculate it, the one percent in China is kind of analogous to the CCP, right? The numbers actually work out. You know, if you go one point four to the members of the party, it's actually a little bit less than one percent, but it's it's analogous to the one percent in the U.S. So it's the one percent and the one percent that have merged, but everybody else. Whether you're La Baixing in in China or whether you're just you know an American you know working class middle class you know it's it's not helping you 
And so the question is, at least on this side of the divide, at least in the West, I think a lot more people are starting to get that. And I, I do think that you're going to start seeing a new generation of political leaders that are going to have to address this thing, because it's been one of the biggest conversation shifts that I've seen in uh, this entire space over the past God, 15 years that I've there that I've been here. Well, I think that's a nice, hopeful note to end on. Thanks again for joining us, Jack. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. Keep up the great work. You know, I was thinking about what Jack was saying about how, you know, like the 1% of America and the 1% of China are coming together, sort of a 2%, if you will. Um, it's a crazy idea, but hear me out, hear me out. What if... Shelly, you seem nervous. No, no, no. I'm just no, thinking about how you, how you can't add percentages, but go ahead. I just did. <laughs> it's not how math works, but please go. Hey, on. who says how math works? Okay, yes, okay. Uh, so, so hear me out, crazy idea. What if the people take all of the money from these you know, rich oligarchs and we just divide it amongst the people? So what you're saying is kill the rich and take their stuff. Yeah, and I think I'll be in charge. <laughs> you're gonna it's, love it you know you know what i love is is like you say that as a joke but it's actually kind of what xi jinping is saying he wants to do uh well he didn't say anything about killing people yeah but he, but he did wants say no the word rich prosperity. just have to give up some of their stuff for the benefit of all right that's kind of what mao said too which is what rich people are definitely always willing to do and they're not yeah. just trying to funnel their money out of china as fast as possible exactly yeah, we need. We should make an offer to Jack Ma. Hey, ditch China, become a rich American. Think about that. And then, once we've lured him here, we beat him up and take his stuff. Uh, the problem is trying to get his money out of China. Yeah, that is a, Dude, that is a if, trick. If you're worth a billion dollars and you can only get 50000 out a year. Well, we he's, know that's not how they do it. But he just still. puts it all in NFTs. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yes, there you go. Yeah, I know, but it would still take like 20,000 years to get your money out. But anyway, it doesn't matter. What is math? What, I don't what know is what math? math is. You take a percent, divide it in half, and what do you get? Half a percent. Okay. <laughs> this is I'm the not kind. Of, I'm not arguing with that. This is the kind of math that uh, will create our communist utopia. Uh, End of the day, huh? Yeah, no, kind of tired, great. everyone. Because you know, I came out with a great, great suggestion. You're just, you know, we're we're not uh, enthusiastic enough about the revolution. Yeah, I don't understand why not. I you know, I appreciate how hard it must have been for Marx. <laughs> he comes up with this idea and like you know, hey guys. Check this out. And just, you know, kind of crickets yeah. for a while. Well, decades went by before yeah. anything really happened with that. And there's the Paris Commune kind of Marxist. And then the Russian Revolution. Those were also decades apart. I mean, yeah, just it didn't go well for him. Someday the people of the future will realize my genius. Yeah. But those people are not me and Shelley. So what happens if you add 1% and 1%? Matt, can you explain? Thanks for watching China Unscripted. <laughs> I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Kinesta. Talk to you next time.